Patricia Nedved has over 25 years of experience as a nurse and has held a variety of positions within the last 15 years in progressive leadership roles. She currently works as the Associate Vice President, Professional Nursing Practice, with global oversight of nursing, education, training, patient safety, quality, magnet, and the electronic health record at Rush University Medical Center in Chicago. She has presented at multiple conferences on the ad 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 adaptation of the electronic health record to improve outcomes. Maria Rubio possesses a strong background in training needs assessment, design implementation, and evaluation of training programs. Her efforts have demonstrated a direct impact on project success, increased performance, and organizational effectiveness, especially in healthcare. Currently, Maria leads Burwood's group training and development practice area, and additionally, she manages Burwood's international office in Lima, Peru, where she transfers knowledge and best practices around the importance of technology, process, and people alignment. Now, please join me in extending a warm welcome to Patricia Nedved and Maria Rubio. Welcome, everyone. We're very excited to have you here. We're very excited to be here and to share our knowledge and expertise with you, hoping that you take away something from the session. Um, you know, definitely for those of you that might be um, currently going through a facility transformation process or those of you that, um, you know, hope to have that challenge as part of your career in the future. So as we get started here, how many of you, just to get a, a better idea of our audience here, how many of you have already gone through a new facility transition or a new facility transformation? Okay, so minority maybe. How many of you um, are currently going through it or know it's coming up? Okay, some more. So, um, you know, I think going through through the opening of a new facility in healthcare is something that um, most of us probably don't do more than once in our lifetime, right? It's it's a very long-term, exhausting project, uh, but definitely interesting. So today we want to share some of that experience with you. And our first learning objective here is to recognize what is involved in properly planning for a training program to ensure a successful transition into a new facility. So as some of you already know, uh, planning for a new facility probably takes five, six years in average. Um, you know, a big financial investment, a big investment in time and resources. So there's a lot of planning that comes with it and, um, you know, a lot of years um, in the works, but really what's critical, it's the last few months, right? The last few months, really, everything comes down to the wire and every minute counts. So we wanted to share with you our experience in planning for that transition. The second learning objective is the, uh, to identify the impact of training on clinical workflow and technology adoption. And um, as you may imagine, a new facility, a new hospital, probably has over 30, 30 plus vendors. Um, coming into the facility, lots of new technology, and um, I might get in trouble for saying this because I do work for Burwood Group, who's a technology consulting company, but I do come from the training world. So to me, it's it's a lot more than just the technology, and that's why we're here uh, here to share with you that it's really the adoption of it, right? As we all know, the technology could sit there, and if it's not properly used, and if we, the end users are not uh, taking advantage of it and using it as it was designed to, then the return on the investment um, goes down, right? So we want to talk about the adoption of the technology, but primarily the workflows that the technology supports and, and the reason why the technology is there. And finally, uh, we want to describe the challenges that uh, Rush University Medical Center was able to overcome through the early planning and implementation of a very well-structured training program. And, um, you know, as you can imagine, this, a project this size um, has a lot of challenges. And through very proactive and a proactive approach and early planning, we were able to identify some challenges that uh, we were able to overcome. 
and some others, as you can imagine, that we could not easily overcome, but by identifying them, we were able to mitigate them and obviously minimize the impact. So, you know, some of the solutions that we'll go over today will, will help you understand, you know, how we, we address those challenges. So quick agenda here. Uh, we'll start with a background just to set up the context of, of Rush and the new tower, the goals that, that Rush had for this transition, um, the challenges that we identified and, and the solutions that we put in place to, to deliver a successful training program, and the outcomes. And the outcomes is something that, you know, Patty, Patty here was um, able to measure right away, and it's still constantly measuring, so she'll go over that um, in more detail. And of course, in the end, uh, recommendations of, you know, how, how you could do this in the future, and for those of you that may not be currently going through, through this process, I think there's a lot of takeaways um, from today's session that will apply to any, any environment and any change process, whether it is a new facility or just any kind of initiative of process that requires change and adoption. So with that said, um, I promise I won't be talking the entire time. Um, we can get started here with a background. Uh, Rush University Medical Center um, encompasses 664 bed hospital, serving both adults and children. And the new tower was scheduled to open in January 2012 with, with 376 um, beds. The Department of Professional Nursing Practice, led by Patty here, was tasked with the design and the implementation of a training program. Um, definitely no small task um, and a lot of pressure and expectations on making sure that the staff was properly prepared for the new technologies and the new environment. And again, you'll probably hear me say this a lot during this presentation. Um, when it comes down to it, it's really not about the technology. It's about what that means to the staff and to the patients, right? So with new technology comes what comes um, new workflows, right, that are going to be put in place and designed in order for that technology to work properly or that solution. Um, also, some existing work, uh, workflows that will be impacted by new technologies coming in. Um, and as you can all imagine, with new, new technologies, new, new workflows comes a lot of anxiety, right? Every time there's change, people react differently, and there's anxiety, and there's new expectations, and there's new skill sets, and uh, there's a lot of new metrics, right? So. All of that um, is what we refer to, or, or what I refer to, to professional readiness. So uh, the, de the Department of Professional Nursing Practice was really tasked with, you know, a, a big initiative that was, you know, making sure that the staff was ready for a new normal, which is what Patty calls it, a new normal, the new environment, and to be able to provide uh, the best patient care since day one. Good morning. I'm Patty Nedved from Rush University Medical Center. Thank you all for coming this morning. Um, what I wanted to walk you through now for the next several slides are some of our goals and our challenges and then some of the implementation that we, we put in place. Um, the goals initially were to f make sure that we facilitated a successful transition. We wanted to ensure that our staff were trained and felt confident and were well prepared as they moved into this new environment. Not only the new technologies, but also just the physical space. But staff, in order to um, build some of that buy-in or ownership and that adoption, we did have staff involved in the facility design. We went so far as to, um, we used to have tennis courts on our property and that's where we actually broke ground for the new building. And what we did before breaking ground is we actually drew one of the units on the tennis courts and had people physically walk the space to make sure that how it was designed was going to meet their needs, put them closer to their patients. Um, it was a, a big culture change because we moved away from the whole centralized nursing station to many decentralized pods and work areas, and we wanted people to, to develop a level of comfort with that uh, before we even broke ground. So we actually, based on that feedback, changed our architectural design. Um, to we, we had more of a, a square design initially, and we ended up um, moving it more to rounded tips, more like a butterfly, so that um, staff could have better lines of sight and also um, be closer to their patients. And that was based on some of that uh, walkthrough that they did. 
Um, we also had them look at mock rooms. We built some mock rooms, and they were able to change the head walls. They were able to move uh, their gases, put them in the places that they thought were most useful and would be most beneficial to patient care. So right from the outset, that helped to um, build a sense of ownership and adoption even before we broke ground. They were also um, involved in the design of our workflows. So ensuring those clinical workflows and technology adoption helps by having the staff who are going to be using it every day help develop some of those workflows. So they, they worked on the clinical communication uh, teams to help design when they would get calls, when they would be notified of patient service requests and things of that nature. We wanted to expose our staff to as many new technologies as possible prior to our move. And we also wanted to illustrate the highlights of those systems. To Maria's point that she made earlier, we wanted to make sure that they were going to be using the technology and not uh, letting it sit there. So we wanted to make sure that um, they, they had the knowledge going forward prior to uh, moving into the tower so that they knew how to use the equipment when they got there. And, and quite frankly, we've had to do some re-education throughout the first year that we've been in the tower. We wanted to um, continue our same level of quality of patient care. And so we really wanted to enhance it and make it better, but we certainly didn't want to see it go in the other direction. And so that was one of the, the big guiding principles is that we maintain that same level of quality as we move. And there's tremendous change, and we just wanted to try and minimize that anxiety and uh, knowing how significant that impact would be. Now for some of the challenges. So we had over 2,000 staff members that we needed to train on clinical workflows, technologies, and we needed to make sure that it was done on time because we were not going to be modifying our move date, and we wanted to make sure that it was done on budget. And so it's one thing to have your facility ready, so your physical space, but it's a completely different scenario to have your staff professionally ready um, and feeling that level of comfort and being able to take care of patients when they move. So things that we did need to train on that were, you know, causing us um, uh, the challenges, clinical communication systems. We bought all new physiologic monitors. Um, we had uh, new medication rooms that were completely different. We didn't have medication rooms. We had a new supply system. Um, the rooms were completely different. As I mentioned, the culture was going to be different because we were moving from centralized nurses' stations to something that was decentralized. And so just thinking about the impact on socialization and norms that have been built around that central nurses' station. And then, of course, the uh, continued adoption and use of the electronic health record. We were moving devices into the patients' rooms, and so that was going to be different for staff as well. This specifically goes into some of those changes. In the physical environment, the construction timeliness and the facility readiness to allow for our training three months in advance, this wasn't done. So this was one of our biggest challenges. In fact, when we started training, we were um, going to be, have to wear hard hats and uh, vests up until I think it was maybe three days or four days before we began training. Um, we finally got the clearance to be able to go in without wearing a, a per personal protective equipment. But there was construction still going on during the training, so that did present challenges. The vendor coordination, making sure that all the vendors were going to be available to assist with the training. Um, the technology testing to align with our workflows. So some of that was still going on while we were training. Um, the, the fact that we had units that were both med, med surge as well as adult critical care, um, the units were not going to be identical, but they were similar enough, but knowing that we weren't able to train on every unit, so that caused anxiety for some staff. So we did need to um, modify and individualize our training so that we were sure to hit on those key points that were going to be alike and then those key points that were going to be different between those two different types of units. We wanted to uh, make sure that we reinforced all of the changes because what had happened is be due to the fact that the construction was still occurring and some of the testing was going on, what people got in the beginning when they first started training was very different than what people received in training in the final week. 
And so we um, made sure to send out reinforcements every week in terms of communications, FAQs. Um, we did, you know, the FAQs that came up in training, we addressed and sent out widely to the audience. We did um, e-learning modules that supported the training. We had post-tests. Um, so there was constant communication, and we also posted everything on a portal that was available to all staff from a clinical resource perspective. So some of our solutions. So all of our solutions, you know, we, we start with our outcome in mind. We knew that we wanted to increase communication and have immediate communication from our patients to our staff. We wanted to realize some efficiencies, most definitely. And we wanted to both improve patients' clinical outcomes as well as the patient experience. That, those were our kind of our guiding principles as we, we prepared to move for the tower. Um, we wanted to design the workflow-driven training, develop role-specific learning paths, and design a blended delivery strategy to enhance the knowledge retention. Uh, we know that we needed a partner to do this because when I set out and was charged with this um, training program and to come up with a model, I, I had limited resources. I had 11 staff um, that also had to maintain their regular roles in addition to uh, providing this training. And so we had an idea in mind. We wanted to create a passport. That was, uh, we knew that. We had this dream of this passport and that staff would actually be um, visiting new countries. And so at every station where they received some element of training, they would get a stamp after visiting that country. And then at the completion of their passport or the training, um, they received a, a stamp that said they were a citizen of the tower. And so that's where, uh, after I developed a budget and looked at the resources that were needed, the time that was allotted, I knew that we needed a partner. And so that's when we reached out to Burwood. Um, and they were a fantastic partner um, throughout this process. And this is a little bit like what training was at when we were in the new tower and construction was going on and we just needed to adapt to the environment. So we're just, it's, part of, it's part of our planning here. We're simulating. Um, so, you know, when, when we, we um, started talking to, to Patty about this, this project or this opportunity, um, like she said, they had, they had a passport training, uh, passport concept in mind. And um, we were really there to just help them uh, bring it, you know, bring the idea up to, to bring it to fruition and, and, and make it a reality. And uh, we knew, you know, she, she told us she had some gaps in terms of resources and additional things that we could step in and help her with. So just to give you a, a recap of, of the process um, in terms of developing the solution and how we really helped Patty and her team, um, I don't know if anyone is familiar with instructional design. There's, there's some model that's called the Addy model that um, probably I overuse a little too much, but um, it's an instructional design model that kind of walks you through the phases, and I use that model a lot for just managing and designing a training solution and managing that from beginning to, to end. So Eddie um, starts with, obviously, A for assessment, and that's where we started with Patty. Um, really just assessing what, what the training needs were, understanding a little bit better what were the, which were the units that were going to be the most impacted, uh, which units needed what training, uh, which roles needed what training. And from there, we really came up with a list of, you know, these are definitely the most popular training topics that are going to need to be delivered uh, f very frequently. And we had to identify what is the best way to deliver that training. And there was a combination of things. There was a combination of, um, you know, learning styles that we needed to address that we'll go into a little bit more detail in a little bit. And um, also, you know, the different delivery components. So, um, you know, through the assessment, we were able to identify the best solution for that. And then we went into the design uh, process. So, you know, again, the passport uh, theme, um, you know, requires some design in terms of, you know, the, the logistics, the program components, the different stations that people were going to walk through, um, even just the little passport booklet that we were going to give out to, to participants to really make the experience a more, um, you know, memorable experience and make sure that they, uh, you know, they, they really got the theme of the program. So that was the design part of it. And then, you know, within the ADI process, we move into the development, which is uh, a big part of the process, and that's the content development. 
And for content development, um, we looked at all types of different material. There was definitely material needed for instructor-led training sessions. Uh, there were some sessions that were conducted in a classroom setting, and then uh, we moved into patient rooms to do demonstration of, of the systems and return demos. Um, there was also, like Patty mentioned, e-learning modules for which we needed to create the, develop the content, and then additional supportive, you know, training material that was needed throughout the program, as well as assessments that we wanted to put together to make sure, like Patty said, we were reinforcing the, 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 the knowledge throughout the experience, um, and actually assessments where, um, you know, implemented or incorporated throughout the experience before, during, and after the training. And then we move into implementation, which in the training world really comes down to delivery, but delivery is just a component of the overall project implementation. And when we talk about implementation and we're talking about the training program and being in the building in and out every day, uh, we really had an army, an army of people that were helping, you know, Patty's resources, Borwood's resources, um, as well as resources from other areas like the Office of Transformation, Project Management, ITS, um, you know, a lot of different resources. So that's when it really comes down to the wire. Every single minute counts, and we are on this, you know, training mode day after day for, for three months. So, you know, the delivery of the training was um, definitely, um, you know, a challenging experience because a lot of things have had mentioned already, like, you know, being, being there while construction was still going on and while still there was still testing of some programs and um, systems and some configuration going on. So there was definitely a combination of things. Um, but then, you know, throughout the delivery, there was definitely some evaluation going on. And um, Patty will go over uh, the evaluation here we go with the construction again. Um, Patty will go over the evaluation, um, you know, a little bit later on during the presentation. But um, I think that's definitely the last phase of the ADI model that people tend to forget because it's such a struggle sometimes to get the implementation and the delivery that uh, we're all exhausted at the end of it, and we tend to forget to evaluate. And I think it's really important to plan for the evaluation ahead of time, be able to have a before and after so that you can compare, and that you're always evaluating throughout the experience, throughout the training, and after the training as well. Moving into the implementation, a little bit more detail about what this passport program really entailed. Um, the registration was done online by staff and by unit uh, leadership. And uh, I think a key component here was the very close collaboration that we had with, um, you know, Patty's team and the fact that she had a dedicated resource to project coordination. And I think that was extremely important because there is a lot of work that goes uh, you know, goes behind the scenes really in the back end to really make all of this happen. So just to be able to, to track and manage all of this training in the learning management system, I don't know how many of you have a learning management system, but if, if you don't in your organization, there's probably, you're probably going to find a way to manage training, right? Some kind of portal, some kind of tool, and a lot of times is, you know, Excel spreadsheets. So there's a lot of work that goes into that, um, inputting the data into the system, creating all the plans for each unit, for each role, creating all the, you know, the mandatory, assigning the mandatory training, uploading all of the training content, the material that we wanted people to, staff to be able to access, you know, as uh, reinforcement, but also as mandatory assessments and things like that that they needed to complete. And on top of it, the ongoing, the daily coordination, management, administration of this, of this training program. So, you know, having a dedicated project coordinator um, like we had at Rush was extremely, extremely helpful. Um, we knew that knowledge retention had to be one of our focuses because we were training three months in advance. And at the beginning, when I mentioned there were some challenges that we were able to identify that uh, we could overcome and some others that we just knew it was a reality and that we just needed to deal with it, um, having to start training three months in advance was definitely one of those challenges. A lot of you are probably thinking, how could you possibly train three months in advance? I can barely remember what I learned yesterday, right? So here we are expecting our staff to remember or seeing something, you know, three months prior to go live and then going in day one and remembering how to operate all these new, these new systems and all the new workflows. 
So we knew that was a challenge, but um, there were things that we needed just to adapt to and take into consideration. And there was um, definitely scheduling conflicts. If, if we're talking about 2,000 staff members that need to go through training, we can't just fit all of them in, you know, a two-week time frame before we go live. It's just not possible. I know all of you know about the complexity of scheduling, um, you know, hospital staff. And there was a lot of other scheduling conflicts that actually came into play as well, such as the facility readiness, the construction, uh, a lot of vendor coordination. Some vendors were behind in delivering their solutions, a lot of testing going on. So, you know, when we took all of that into consideration and we wanted to stay on track, on budget, very important, we knew that we had to start three months in advance. And I think the early planning was what allowed us to do that. I think if we would have started thinking about this three months prior to go live, we would have been in trouble, right? So being able to start training three months in advance was key, but also posed a new challenge for us, for us which, which was knowledge retention and skills assessment. So we incorporated a lot of, of testing, a lot of reinforcement through the proper material, a lot of assessments. And we tried to make sure that the training was a, an active participation, right? That it was very hands-on. There was return demonstrations for those topics and those systems that made sense, like lift equipment. We wanted, obviously, to make sure that, you know, we we could prove that, uh, that the staff was comfortable utilizing the, the lift equipment, as well as the, the clinical communication system, which was an integration of three, four different tools and vendors. So we wanted to make sure that they were able to utilize that properly when they were in a patient room. So we definitely did a lot of demonstration of that as well. So, you know, I think the hands-on exposure and the demonstration component was definitely key. And the passport theme, the passport program overall was designed with that in mind. So the different components, I think, allowed, allowed um, the staff to really uh, be accountable for their own learning. So, you know, there was a, a component of them walking around doing a lot of wayfinding, navigating through the new environment. Um, the scavenger hunt always helps, right, trying to find those 10 key uh, things that you need to know where they are and, um, you know, walking around the unit. And there were some um, components that were self-paced, so the self-paced stations, we call them, or, or the, the countries that they needed to visit throughout their passport experience. Um, there were other vendors in, on the floor that they needed to stop by and visit. And, you know, of course, the mandatory, the mandatory training. Um, so the little passport booklets that you, that you see here in the picture um, were custom to units and to roles. So there were different sections and the, the roles and the units that were required to complete that section was listed there. So each person picked up their passport at the beginning of the training day and they knew exactly what they needed to do for the day. And again, some of it was scheduled uh, training that started, you know, every hour, every two hours that they needed to, to get in that class. And some of it was more exploratory and self-paced and they still needed to complete it, but they were able to freely navigate through the unit and, and find those components and complete them on their own. And then um, lastly, we had obviously a, a big technology component and um, the technology training, again, like I said at the beginning, it was more than just the, the buttonology, right? The click here, click there, this is your new fancy device you're gonna be carrying with you. It was really more about uh, make, making sure that we were highlighting what that technology was there for and what was the purpose of the technology, what was the value that it was bringing to the organization. So making sure that it was very workflow driven and our focus, obviously we wanted to make sure that people were utilizing the technology, but the ultimate goal was to really have them adapt the workflow that the technology was supporting. So with that in mind, we wanted to emphasize on the fact that, you know, we definitely had a blended learning approach. Um, as you can imagine, um, you know, in today's workforce, there's a, a variety of, of staff members. We have different generations. We have different learning styles. And uh, we wanted to make sure that we included adult learning theories in the design of this training. And um, all of us being adults, 
uh, you know, we know that we learn differently than, than children, and there's uh, very important things that we need to take into consideration to make sure that, you know, they, they are feeling engaged and that they are learning and retaining what we're teaching them. So one of the key things that we take into consideration when we are uh, designing for adult learning is that they're very goal-oriented, and I'm sure that most of you could relate to that. You want to make sure what's, that you understand what's your ultimate goal, why are you here for, what are you supposed to accomplish, right? So with that in mind, we made a, an effort of constantly highlighting what the outcomes were supposed to be. And these were the organizational outcomes, increased collaboration, efficiency, and, and patient care, and you know how that translated into a staff day-to-day -day within their unit and within their roles. We as adults also want to make sure that everything that we're learning is relevant, right? That why do I need to know this? Why is it important for me? And uh, we wanted to make sure that they, they knew exactly how that was going to impact their day to day and make, make their job better and, you know, allow them to provide better patient care. So we made sure that the workflows were custom to the, the units. We make sure that the training that they were assigned was something that they saw relevancy to, that they, they knew, they understood why it was important to them and why it was required to them. We didn't want to overwhelm them with a lot of information. We just wanted them to, uh, you know, learn what they needed to learn. And of course, adults, we, we need to see immediate value on what we're doing. Why am I investing my time? Why am I putting effort into learning this? And, uh, you know, what, what's the value? What's the return on my investment? Um, so we definitely address that. And, and you know, adults being self-directed and, um, you know, wanted to, to have a hands-on participation. Um, like I said before, we made sure that the program included all of those components. So there was a self-paced component, and there was also a lot of accountability that was, uh, you know, put on participants. And I think Patty's team was, you know, very successful in making that happen, holding people accountable for, for their participation and for their completion of training. Um, you know, the, the approach included online modules, self-paced stations, instructor-led training sessions. Again, um, you know, it started in a classroom setting, and then we moved into demonstration setting where we could do return demos. Um, and the audience included, it was required, the training program was required for nurses, PCTs, and unit clerks. And then our approach was to have super users from different units, such as dietary, house staff, pharmacy, therapies, and chaplains, and then they took on the responsibility of training their own teams, their respective teams. So with what we had provided in terms of content, material, and training, they were able to customize the training to what their teams really needed. Um, when we designed the, the nursing training program, uh, it was the envy of other disciplines, and so that's how we developed the super user concept from the other disciplines because they were um, very much in desiring a program that, similar to what we had developed, and, and they really um, uh, liked that program, and so they were able to take you know knowledge from what we had created basically for nursing and adapt it to their own disciplines, which was really great. Um, just to really emphasize again the different learning principles, I'm going to walk you through one of the workflows that we trained on. And this, this particular, uh, the clinical communication systems utilized many of the blended learning approaches that Maria spoke about. For the example is the, the day started with everyone taking a tour of the facility, which was an hour in length. Um, and they went around and they did many of the joint commission uh, required life safety um, training elements and, uh, you know, wayfinding, fire safety, those types of things. And then they were delivered up to the unit where we were uh, completing the training. And the group went, uh, the classes were 20, 20 people per class, and they all came together to begin to do some of the clinical communication training. And the first part was a didactic. Um, one of the, the Burwood trainers was in the room, and they were responsible for delivering a PowerPoint content and actually walking through some of the workflows, utilizing slides such as this. So you'll see here that um, we have the, the call to the caregiver request. When, when the uh, patient puts out a call, uh, it'll ring several places. It'll ring on the console phone. It goes to a PC where people can see that information. And then it also illuminates a dome light outside of the door based on the type of service call. So, for example, if it was a pain request, if they press the pain button um, needing something for pain, the light outside the room would be green, indicating that they needed a nurse. 
um, because the nurse is the one that needs to respond to that call because that's something that is a nurse's responsibility as opposed to unlicensed support personnel. And so that call then it simultaneously will go out to the nurse. It'll ring on their, their wireless phone that they're carrying. It'll say that it's a pain call and it'll let them know what room number it is. So automatically, you know, the nurse has information before even responding to that patient, whether in person or um, picking up the phone and answering initially. That is one workflow, though, however, that does not get ended until the um, nurse actually is present in the patient's room. And that versus ID tag, which you'll see down there um, toward the bottom right, is uh, something that will then shut off the uh, or end the service call when the um, nurse arrives into the patient's room. So once we did this didactic portion of the training, then we took the entire class into a patient room and walked through the scenarios. And so actually pushed the buttons, used the versus tag, showed them how it illuminated. So you have both of those learning processes. You have the, the didactic for the, the visual learner. You've got something for the hands-on and, of course, the auditory for those that learn best by hearing. Um, the workflows that we built were directly uh, trying to impact our HCAP score. So not only making things easier for the staff so that they have information before um, seeing the patient, but also trying to drive improvements in our HCAP scores in terms of responsiveness. And we'll show you some more of that as we get through um, some of these slides. This is another workflow that we, we trained on. Um, while the technology wasn't completely <coughs> new to us, we did have a pneumatic tube system. However, it was a different size. So we had a four-inch tube system that was in our older facilities and was going to remain there. Uh, but the new technology was a six-inch tube. So it was very different um, than when, what we were used to in terms of how it latches and how it travels through the system. And they don't speak. And so we had to build redundancy in areas like pharmacy and the lab so that um, all of our patient care areas could um, get tubes in and out of those areas for deliveries. But one of the things that uh, we trained on, we used a video here, and then we also had a hands-on demo with one of my staff who was manning that station. In our old areas, or our older pavilions where we're taking care of patients, the tubes are in a unit clerk's area. So I don't know how many here have their tube systems in where the unit clerk is, right? So the unit clerk can automatically um, get the tube and be able to determine where that product needs to go. Well, the design of our new facility, um, we don't always have unit clerks 24-7 on some of our units now. And we have an on-stage and an off-stage area. So we built the tube system in the, the off-stage area, which was accessible for staff. But it's in a hallway, and it's, it's not um, manned by personnel 24-7. So that was a, a new um, workflow, very new design, and not something that we were used to. So now the nurses and, and the patient care techs would receive a page. So if a transaction came from the pharmacy, it would be a secure transaction. A page would go out to the nurse, and then the nurse would get uh, an indication that they had something that was secure in the tube system, so they would have to go to that hallway and then retrieve the tube. So that workflow was very different um, than how we currently use the system. So same technology, very different use. The other um, piece that was extremely different for us was our, our rooms. So the patient rooms were very different. Um, as you know, when you build a new tower, you've got lots of, of new technologies to incorporate into the patient's room, and they're obviously very different than what you have in your existing facilities. Our new patient care room was created with zones. So there is a patient zone, patient, uh, there's a family zone, and then there is a staff zone. So when you first enter the room, there's a staff zone. There's our sinks there. Um, there is waterless hand hygiene, uh, both directly outside of the room, directly inside the door, and then there's an automatic on-off sink um, over to the right. So lots of opportunities for hand hygiene. Um, and the uh, supply, there's a little supply closet for staff, and then you enter into the patient zone. So there's the patient's bathroom where we had things like, um, you know, we trained about the flooring and the special tile that was put on the floor, uh, the elements of the, the shower chair in every room that's attached to the wall. We have a safety feature that we built in the, the bathroom um, for the door so that it swings both ways in and out. So in the event that the patient were to fall behind the door and they were blocking the access, um, you'd be able to pull the door out. So that was something that we um, felt was important. 
Um, one thing we did realize during training, and this is where, you know, training the actual environment um, very much helps you realize where uh, some of the shortcomings are. We had grab bars installed um, in all the bathrooms. So when the patient got up, they could uh, grab the bar as they were getting close to the door. And what we realized is when you opened the door, your hand would get caught in the door with where the grab bars were placed. So during training, we realized that, so they were able to remove all those grab bars and um, place them in a different location. Uh, that was something that was very important. Another thing that we, we studied before um, moving was a, a kind of a unique design. Um, we built a laptop on a stick that we put on the foot of the bed of our adult critical care beds. Um, the staff trialed it. We had a, a modified um, mock-up with some PVC tubing and, um, you know, trialed it before we moved into the tower, and people felt that it was uh, something that they could support and, and put some closer to the patient, so they'd be actually documenting at the foot of the bed. So just think about the enhancements of being able to assess a patient and um, being documenting right there. Well, after moving into the tower, I think it was about um, nine or ten months later, the staff really felt that it was not meeting their needs. And so that was something that we designed going into the tower, and now they've all been removed. And so they're back on uh, uh, carts in the room, and staff find that to be a much better way. So it's that constant evaluation process and learning from the staff and, and being open to making those changes, I think, is something that really makes the adoption successful. And then this just brings us to, you know, what, what really made this overall experience successful. Um, like we said, the very close um, collaboration with the professional nursing team, um, you know, the, the governance that they had and the, the daily logistics, the administration, the coordination, the management of, of the day to day, and having a dedicated project coordination resource, um, that definitely was a key component. Um, the super user approach uh, was definitely something that we, we consider it to be extremely helpful in every every new tower that we that we do, and what we did at Rush uh, was internal super users as well as external. Meaning, um, like we said before, there were internal super users that kind of took on the responsibility of learning what they needed to learn to then go go ahead and properly train their teams. Um, we also have uh, we also had specific super users that were assigned to specific vendors or subject matter experts for for vendors and um, specific technologies that were instrumental in the process of content development and validation um, of the workflows and the content that we wanted to deliver. And then we also took on a super user approach, which, which I call external because Burwood was just an ex extension of Patty's team. And, and we took on the super user role in a couple of scenarios because um, in one component, the clinical communication technology was, was new to Rush, but Burwood had been working with clinical communication for quite a while with different organizations. So that was kind of our expertise. We had been involved with Rush for over a year in the project management of that, of that solution. So we were able to bring in a lot of detail and information around the workflows and how the ClinCom system was going to impact the day-to-day. -day. So we took on the super user approach on that. Um, and we were able to, to train everyone else and develop the content as well. And then, you know, lift equipment was another scenario, another example where it just required a lot of additional time for resources to go off-site and get trained, um, you know, for the proper delivery of this and then to come back and deliver, um, put the content together and deliver training. So, you know, due to a shortage of resources, we kind of stepped in and helped with that as well. And I think overall the super user approach um, you know, really helps in any kind of scenario, but I think it's important to keep in mind that it shouldn't be the only approach, right? It shouldn't be the only way to train individuals. Um, we had a very close collaboration with the Office of Transformation. Um, you know, like I said before, we were engaged in the project management uh, a year or a year and a half before Go Live, and, um, you know, I think everyone involved had a very close relationship with them in terms of identifying the facility readiness, the components, the construction times, the uh, blackout days, when inspection was happening, when we still needed to wear, to wear the hard hats or not, um, the areas that were allowed for training. And so the day-to-day -day of training and the planning uh, towards training was really, um, you know, impacted by, by the, the work that the Office of Transformation was doing. 
And that really came along with uh, the close collaboration with the IT project management, as you can imagine, with a lot of new technologies and new systems. We really need to work closely with them because any small delay on the configuration or the testing definitely impacts training, right? So if we think about content development for training, uh, we're, ta we're not talking about go life. We're talking about T minus a month, maybe, a month and a half, that we need to have all content ready and, and validated because um, it takes a while. So, you know, if, if we are developing content and the training on the, the, the technology or the IT project management office is still doing configuration and testing and, and, and changing things around, then our content needs to change as well in order to deliver accurate training. So that was um, a key component working closely with them. Um, having designated training resources for design and delivery, um, you know, that it really becomes a full-time job. Um, and I think that's usually underestimated. I think a lot of times we see organizations where they think that you can kind of juggle it and, you know, do two or three things at a time. And when it comes down to it and you're talking about this six years of planning and investment that's really coming down to the wire in a few months, uh, you definitely want to have designated resources for that, for that component, the design and the delivery part of it. The content validation, um, I have to say this has been one of the best experiences from all the organizations that we have helped transition into a new facility. And I'm not saying that just because Patty's here, but uh, the truth is that we had a very smooth content validation process. It was very organized. There were subject matter experts assigned to it, and the process um, just made it very much, um, very easy to, to finalize content, make sure that it was accurate, make sure that it was tested, approved, and that we could actually publish it ahead of time so it was in the portal available for, for the staff to review before training. And, of course, uh, post-training assessments, like I said before, evaluation was conducted, you know, during the training experience and after, and we wanted to make sure that it was ongoing, uh, ongoing assessments, assessments that we had, you know, during the return demos and the, the demonstration, the in-person training, but also assessments that were included in the, in the learning management system that was mandatory for staff and that they needed to um, keep trying until they got the answers right. So I think that was a big part of it. Okay, so now we're going to look at a few of the outcomes. Um, you know, as, as Maria mentioned, we did do an evaluation um, post the training program to determine its success and then to, to, to realize what we've learned from the experience and how we would do it differently in the future. And um, we'll... One thing that we are going to be doing is we're going to be using this model again um, because we're getting ready to move three new units. And so we've learned a ton from this experience that we can take into this um, next program of, of training. We're moving our labor and delivery, our neonatal intensive care unit, as well as our mother baby unit. And so very different areas, very discreetly different, um, but we are going to take this same model and, and, and bring it forward. And um, hopefully we'll have some time at the end to talk a little bit about you know, what we, we did learn. Um, some of our success <laughs> metrics, we, as you know, we, we mentioned we trained over 2,000 staff, 980 nurses, 450 interventional imaging staff, which was a, a very different set of training than in the inpatient units. Um, 600 support staff, we had 300 ambassadors, so those were people that were uh, tour guides and leading the tours of the areas. And then we'll talk a little bit on some of the initial outcomes here. All right, so I don't want to walk through um, each of these because I think a lot of it we've talked about already and uh, we definitely want to leave a, a few minutes, um, you know, for questions. But uh, one of the key recommendations, uh, which is the very first one here, is training for adoption, not for deployment. Uh, what that really means is uh, a lot of times, you know, we're, we're in a crunch time. We need to meet a deployment date, and we're really worried about just making that, 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 that deadline and training, right, just providing some training, any training, whatever type of training we can provide, just to say that we provided training. And I think it's very important to remember that the goal here is to have adoption um, across the board. It's not just to train for deployment. It's not just to make go live, um, you know, happen. I think it's, it's really what we what we want to, to see happen after the training, after the go live. So training for adoption um, is a very different approach than just making training happen. I think we need to, you know, reinforce the knowledge retention. We need to have the structure and the resources available during, uh, during training 
um, and after training as well. So that's a key component for us, and it th- th- would definitely be one of the takeaways from this, from this experience. Um, like we said before, aligning to clinical workflows and organizational outcomes, the collaboration, efficiency, and patient care outcomes were something that really were repeated over and over and over again for many months um, during communication, during newsletters, during training, after training. So it's something that we wanted to make sure that people understood that training uh, was not just to move into a new tower, but what was the reasoning behind the tower and behind the training, behind this, this experience. Um, like, we, like we mentioned before, addressing knowledge retention, um, you know, especially if you do have to train uh, months, weeks in advance, um, you know, that's definitely something to keep in mind. And, and for that, it uh, really helps to have super users and subject matter experts in-house that will help uh, validate uh, the process and continue to transfer knowledge. Uh, uh, Patty here can, can probably tell you more about it, but, uh, you know, they're still using this for new hires as they come in, you know, having utilizing the same knowledge, the same content to make sure that, that they're training new hires the same way that they train those that actually have moved into the tower already. And I think um, planning, being prepared for changes, I think that will occur, continue to occur throughout the experience. As Patty mentioned, you know, they're still making changes. There's a lot of, of lessons learned after training and after the move, um, months after you're still making changes and adapting to, to you know, the, the reaction of staff and the feedback and, and even, like, patient feedback, right? So just being prepared and open to continue to make changes, I think that um, – Moving into the new tower is definitely a, a key milestone, but I think, uh, you know, it's, it's not where it ends. I think, you know, after you move is when you really, you really see what your new normal is going to be and what the reality is going to be for your staff and for your patients. And like I mentioned before, evaluation is something that a lot of times, you know, we underestimate and, and it's a lot of work and we just um, want to make it to go live and we don't take it into consideration, but it's something that we do need to keep in mind and continue to evaluate throughout the, throughout the whole experience. So um, with that, I don't know if you want to add to the recommendations. Um, you know, just, just to, I know we, we have just a couple of minutes left and we want to leave time for questions if there are any, but just to really emphasize the, the whole um, the new normal that Maria has mentioned is that's that's what we called it in our environment where we also did simulation training. So not only did we do this um, hands-on training that everyone went through, but we did do a simulated training where we had actual patients in beds who were ringing the lights and, and doing some testing. So that also, I think, was a real important part of our failure mode um, to try and identify those potential failures. So I, I can't emphasize enough um, the process around completing FEMAs on some of this work as well. And then um, just to go a little bit further into what we did learn and takeaways and recommendations is the, you know, try and wait until your construction is done. Um, That is something that we will have completed for these next three moves as the construction will be done. Um, And then being open to change. So I'm leading an optimization group since we've opened the tower around the clinical communication systems, and we've made multiple changes based on recommendations of staff. And so being open and not being married to, well, this is how we designed it. You have to keep it like this. Um, you know, we really uh, want their feedback and their input. So I think that's it. Any questions? Yeah, I have a, a question for you. Um, with the amount of training hours that you needed, did you have to adjust your schedule, bring in uh, traveling nurses? Uh, did you have to cancel um, or furlough any vacations? And do you have unions at Rush? We um, did not use agency, and I'm happy to say we did not use overtime. And so I think that was the result. We had a very um, detailed budget that we put forward ahead of time, and um, we were able to do it within, within our budget on time without agency staff. Now, after we moved into the tower and we saw an increase in volume, we did have to get some agency staff. And I'm happy to say over this past year we've hired 300 new nurses um, to meet that volume, and we are agency-free again. We have been agency-free for six years. Um, so it was very painful to have to bring them in after we moved, but a good problem to have because we had uh, lots of increased volume. Hi, thank Hi. you very much. I can see how this would work for projects or anything else mm-hmm. as well. Um, I'm a healthcare consultant, Shirley Woodhead, and I have a question about you said that you made the training mandatory. Mm-hmm. How did you uh, discipline or whatever those people that fell out, PRN nurses and other people that never showed up for training, how did you get back to those? In- so we, we did end up having, um, for the, the, the training that we had organized over that three-month period, we did end up having one training day on a weekend. So that helped 
bring in a lot of those PRN and those weekend staff. Um, we did have over 98% of our staff attend during that three months, so we really had just a small incremental uh, group of people that we had to work with. And those people, the responsibility was their manager then took them through. And so we, we did reach 100%. One last question, I'm, I'm told. Okay. With the passport concept, is that something that you're using for continuing education for new staff that come on that weren't around during the go live? We, we, are, we don't have a unit that's vacant any longer, so we are going to use it for these next three moves. But for those staff that are newly hired, um, we do have all of the online supports and the clinical resources that we use during training, and they are assigned all of those as well because we want to make sure that they hear all the same information in a consistent message. And we've uh, done some updated training on the clinical communication system for 100% of our staff, not just new hires. So we're continually reinforcing. with your super users. We had a super user for a, you know, a big go live and uh, we're having difficulty retaining our super users. How do you motivate them? So we um, still use super users for the physiologic monitoring training. Um, they have done some ongoing uh, classes and they continue to train staff on the units. The super users for the lift equipment we still maintain and as, that, as through attrition we have to train additional ones. Um, we don't necessarily have super users around any of our other systems that are currently training. It's more of the preceptor model augmented by the, the e-learning and those types of tools. Because you're right, it is a challenge to, to maintain those. And let's give our speakers a round of applause. <laughs> Thank you for coming.